For much of the early 20th century, Ellis Island is where the ancestors of 40% of U.S. citizens entered the country looking to start a new life. And while most people only spent a few hours on the island, there were some who had to stay longer. And so they would have been eating meals like this one of beef and barley soup, tapioca pudding, bread, and coffee. So thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this video as we find out what our ancestors would have eaten on Ellis Island. This time on Tasting History. Ellis Island sits in New York Harbor, and from 1892 to 1924, it served as the main point of entry for immigrants coming to the United States. The immigrants came from all over the world, but at this time, the vast majority came from Europe. For some, this meant a week-long voyage aboard a steamship. But for those traveling from Southern or Eastern Europe, the arrival on Ellis Island was often the conclusion of a months-long journey and represented the last hurdle to a better life. Now, from 1924 through 1954, when it closed, it was still part of the immigration system, but it was no longer a main point of entry. So I'm going to be focusing on those early decades. But even in that first 30 years, the quality and quantity of food could vary greatly. Sometimes it was very poor and very meager, but at other times they served up full meals, as can be seen in this menu from January 20th, 1920. There was a breakfast of boiled rice with milk and stewed peaches, and a supper of roast beef hash with green peppers and blackberry jelly. And for the midday meal, which they called dinner, there was an English beef soup with barley, lamb stew with vegetables, bread and butter substitute, i.e. margarine, tapioca pudding, and coffee. And I suspect you would either get the beef soup or the lamb stew, so I'm only going to make one of them, and I'm going with the beef soup. But first, I am actually going to make the tapioca pudding because it takes an entire day to make. So the recipe that I'm using comes from Miss Parloa's new cookbook, Cold Tapioca Pudding. Soak a cupful of tapioca overnight in a quart of cold water. In the morning, drain off all the water. Put the tapioca and a quart and half pint of milk in the double boiler. After cooking 45 minutes, add a teaspoonful of salt. Stir well and cook 15 minutes longer. Wet a mold or bowl in cold water, turn the pudding into this, and set away to cool. Serve with sugar and cream. This pudding is also nice hot. So what makes this a little different from a modern tapioca pudding is it doesn't have any eggs in it. But there are old recipes that do have eggs, but those are for tapioca custard. The tapioca puddings never have eggs. So for this eggless tapioca pudding, what you'll need is one cup or 130 grams of tapioca pearls, five cups or 1.2 liters of whole milk, and a teaspoon of salt. So first add the tapioca pearls to a quart of cold water and then let them sit overnight, at least six hours. The next morning, pour off the remaining water and add the pearls to the whole milk in the top pot of a double boiler. Then in the bottom part of the double boiler, bring a couple inches of water to a gentle boil and set the top pot on and let it cook for about 45 minutes. Then add a teaspoon of salt and stir it in and by now it should have started to thicken up a good bit but let it cook for another 15 minutes and then take it off the heat and immediately pour it into a mold or bowl and let it cool to room temperature. And then you can refrigerate it after that. Now, I tried the tapioca pudding at this point just because I was curious what it would taste like without any sugar, and it is not good. It is tasteless and gluey, so that's probably why she suggests it be served with sugar and cream. So if you were on Ellis Island and got served this, you bet you'd be asking for sugar. Or as a German immigrant might ask, Hast du den Zucker? A phrase that I learned during my lesson with Babbel today, who just happens to be sponsoring this video. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world, and all of the lessons are created not by AI, but by actual language teachers. And they're nice and short, about 10 minutes each, so you can always fit in a couple every day. That way, when you're traveling and you find out that they don't have any sugar, you don't have to freak out. You can take it in stride and tell them, Kein Problem, ich gehe schnell zum Supermarkt und kaufe Zucker. I also love that besides the traditional lessons, they also have games to kind of shake things up and podcasts where you can listen to native speakers and it really helps get the language in your ear. Babbel offers a 20-day money-back guarantee and a variety of subscriptions, including a lifetime subscription, which is good because really to master a language, it can take a lifetime. I'm still working on English over here. But it doesn't take a lifetime to start speaking a new language, because Babbel can have you speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. So to give Babbel a try, just click the link in the description or this QR code to get 60% off of your subscription. And now, for our English beef and barley soup, I look to another 19th century cookbook, the White House Cookbook. 
Originally published in 1887, this cookbook remained incredibly popular through the 1920s. Now, the recipe for beef soup is rather long, so I won't read the entire thing, but it is interesting that the beef it calls for is beef shin. This is not the easiest cut of meat to find these days, but a beef shank will work just as well. You need about a pound of the meat chopped up in small pieces and then several sections of the bone too. Then a tablespoon of salt, a teaspoon of pepper, one carrot, two turnips, two tablespoons of pearl barley, one head of celery, one teaspoon summer savory crushed into powder, and a pound of potatoes. So first add the bones and the meat to six quarts of water. Then heat it to a boil, and as it starts to boil, a foamy scum will collect on the top, and you want to get rid of as much of that as you can. Then reduce the heat, set the lid on, and let it boil for two full hours. During that time, not only will the meat soften up, but all of the marrow in the bones will melt out and really flavor the broth. Honestly, the bones are where this soup is going to get most of its flavor. After two hours, add the salt and the pepper, give it a stir, and return the lid and let it cook for another hour. While it cooks, chop up the vegetables into small pieces, and after the meat has cooked for that third hour, add the carrot, two turnips, two tablespoons of pearl barley, the celery, and the savory, and stir everything in. Let it boil for another 15 minutes before adding the potatoes, and then give it another 30 minutes of simmering, this time without the lid. That gives us more than enough time to see what else the immigrants at Ellis Island would have eaten. So you want to know what you would eat on Ellis Island. But first, you should figure out if you're even going there. Because while it was the main point of entry for many coming into the U.S. during the early 20th century, if you had money, you probably never had to step foot on the island. See, most of the people who were coming into New York Harbor were coming in on big steamships. If you were in first or second class, the immigration officials came out to meet you on the boat. There they would do medical and legal inspections, and only if you failed one of those did you have to go to Ellis Island. But if you were in third class, also called steerage, well, everyone was going to the island. So you'd get off the ship at one of the docks in Manhattan and immediately be shuttled onto a ferry bound for the island. That's if it wasn't full up, because sometimes Ellis Island was so packed with people that they wouldn't let any more people on, and so you would have to stay on the ship. There are actually stories of people having to wait two weeks on the ship or else on another ship, if the one you came over on had to leave, just waiting to take that ferry to the island. But supposing you were able to get onto the ferry, this was probably where you got your first taste of American food. This usually came in the form of a cup of cider and a small meat pie or a corned beef sandwich. Sometimes you would also get a most perplexing food called a banana. I read multiple accounts of people getting this fruit and not knowing what a banana was. They had never seen it, and so they didn't know how to eat it. And so others who did know how to eat it would kind of play tricks on them, trying to get them to eat it with the peel still on. But eventually, I, I feel like most people figured it out. Now, to most, these morsels of food from America would have seemed like manna from heaven, because the food in third class on those steamships was not usually great. There were those who served excellent food, even to the people in steerage, mostly from luxury liners like Cunard and White Star Line, but many of the older ships just didn't have that high of standards. The ship was just terrible. We had to live like pigs, and everybody was impolite. The food was bad, too. On the ship, they had herring and potatoes, and when I used to pass the dining room, I inhaled the smell of the herring. I couldn't pass. I couldn't go any more to the dining room. I said, no. It's not for me. There was often some thin soup, or maybe porridge, and of course, cabin biscuits, which was a slightly more palatable version of hardtack. Some liners even made the third-class passengers bring all of their own food with them. So these people wouldn't have had anything fresh for at least a week or two. So a corned beef sandwich, or even a banana with the peel, would have probably seemed like a pretty good thing to eat. But did this delicious food extend to the island itself? Well, that depends. See, most people who arrived on Ellis Island weren't there for very long. 80% of arrivals went through the medical and legal checks, and provided you didn't have typhus and you answered all of their questions correctly, you were back on the ferry within just a few hours. Also, when it came to the questions being asked, there were two types. The first was to make sure that you matched with what was on the ship's manifest. What's your eye color? How old are you? What's your name? Also, they weren't writing these answers down. They were just checking it against the ship's manifest. That was the main document. 
So that idea that somebody got their name changed at Ellis Island, it's a complete myth. Never happened. Uh, there's, or at least there's no evidence to suggest that that ever happened. People often Americanize their names after they got to America. But in that first check, it, it was pretty much always the same as it was back in Europe. Now, the second type of question was to make sure that you weren't going to be a, a burden on society, that you, were, that you had a place to go once you left the island. Do you have family or friends here? Where are you staying? Do you have a job? And that's a trick question, because the answer needs to mean no, because it was illegal to import um, any labor from other countries at the time. But the people would have known that this was a trick question, because they would have gone over all of this on the ship. See, the steamship lines would actually hold classes talking to the, to the immigrants about what questions were going to be asked, because should they answer something wrong, they would be detained and maybe even sent back. And it was all done at the steamship's expense. If you had to stay on the island, the steamship was paying for it. So there was one Romanian immigrant, simply known as Mr. Laufer, who clearly was not paying attention during these classes, because when the officer asked him, do you have any money, he was honest and said no, and so they wouldn't let him leave. But it did mean he got to eat on Ellis Island. That night, they marched us into the dining room. There was paper covering the tables. I thought it was the best dinner I ate in my entire life. I thought, what kind of a country is this, receiving me, a lowly immigrant, with a great dinner like I'm a great guest? I fell in love with America right then and there. The good news is he had an aunt who was living in Brooklyn at the time, so she came and got him the next day, so all's well that ends well. But while he only stayed one night, there were some who had to stay for days or even weeks on the island. So in that case, it was really important what the quality of food being served was. And when it comes to the answer of that, it kind of depends on what year it was. See, when the island first opened, there was a lot of corruption. And so the contractors who were in charge of distributing the food would often skim, you know, off the top, something that never would happen today. In these early years, the menu often consisted of stewed prunes spooned right out of a can on top of some dry bread. Add to that the fact that there was never enough kitchen staff, so the bowls and cups were often used and reused without washing. But in 1903, President Teddy Roosevelt visited the island to learn about its operations, and he was not impressed. And so he created a committee to look into the island and to solve the issues that he saw. And shockingly, it worked. By 1906, we see menus that include beef stew, baked beans, and even taking into account dietary restrictions of the Jewish immigrants, there was a dish called herring for the Hebrews. Some years later in 1911, they even opened a kosher kitchen, considering a quarter of the immigrants at the time were Jewish. Now most everyone, provided they weren't in the infirmary, ate in the main dining hall. At times, men and women were kept separate, children eating with the women, but at other times they ate together. But regardless, they ate in shifts. 1,000 people at a time, sitting at long wooden tables with benches, the tables being lined with white or brown paper. Waiters in white jackets brought the food around. One issue, though, was that because they were eating in shifts, there was never enough time to actually clean the dining room properly, and so it tended to get grimy and, and pretty filthy, until 1908, when they totally redesigned it. Now it had white tile covering the floor and the lower halves of the walls. The corners of the room were made to be slightly curved so dirt and grime couldn't settle, and the dining room floor was slightly sloped toward a set of drains at one end so it could quickly be sprayed down. I kind of imagine it was like eating in a drained Olympic-sized swimming pool. Now, the first decade of the 20th century was definitely the busiest time for Ellis Island, seeing between five and 10,000 immigrants every single day. One day, they topped out at over 11,000. But most would often leave the same day that they got there. But before they did, they could visit one of the food counters at the railroad ticket department. Here they could purchase a box of food for the next leg of their journey. These contain things like two pounds of bread, eight cents, one pound servalot sausage, 22 cents, five sandwiches, 20 cents, four pies, 20 cents, two boxes of cake, 20 cents, oranges and apples, 10 cents. Now this may sound like a heck of a deal to us, but back then it was really expensive. It was like buying food at the airport. 
And it was kind of the same, same issue. You were stuck in a place with no other options, so they could charge whatever they wanted. And uh, some years later, there was an immigrant named Nathan Fishman who, who complained. 50 cents I had to give for two potatoes. No, I wasn't treated so bad, but I had to give the half dollar for two potatoes on Ellis Island. That was the one benefit of actually having to stay on the island for a few days free food. There was actually a sign in the dining hall in English, French, German, Italian, and Yiddish that said, no charge for food here. At least it was no charge to the immigrant, because the people being charged were, again, the steamship company. And it was thought that the reason that people were stuck on Ellis Island was because something went wrong. They were sick, or they didn't have their paperwork in order, something like that. And so it was really the fault of those who ran the steamships, because they should have figured that stuff out before the person even got onto the ship. Now, it only cost about 35 cents per person per day for the food, but there were a lot of people going in every day, so it added up to about a half million dollars a year, which was an enormous sum of money at the time, still is, uh, but really at the time, and whenever there is an enormous sum of money, you can bet there is some corruption hanging around. So just seven years after Roosevelt cleaned up the island, a company called Hudgens and Dumas took over the food on the island. They were a contractor. What is baffling is that this was not their first time. They had had the contract before when Roosevelt came in and cleaned the place up. So they were given a second chance. So it's no surprise that it did not go well. The food given to the immigrants at Ellis Island is not sufficient. The people are half starved there, and therefore, when the tables are set, there is again a scramble. The hungry people grab, in addition to their own, the portions belonging to other people. That was an interview given in 1911 by someone who had been on the island. And what makes it all the worse is that this was a person who had been in a Siberian prison, and he said even the quality of the food was only marginally better on Ellis Island. So in 1913, just 10 years after the first time they had to clean up Ellis Island, it was again time to, to make things right. And this time, it was the brand new Department of Labor who started an investigation. And they found that moldy bread and rotten fish were being served, and they got some pies that were apple pies, opened them up and found just apple cores. One, they found there was nothing in it, it was just crust. And a former chef at Ellis Island, Jacob Minsterman, told the investigating committee yesterday that he had been compelled to use meats that were in bad condition. During my first two weeks there, I complained to the manager that the beef was rotten and showed it to them. They agreed with me that the beef was rotten, but I had to use it for the immigrants. I trimmed and cut off the bad portions and fixed it up. I had to improve its condition with spices and onions. We often had rotten fish there, so rotten that it could not be used. All the beef and mutton were trimmings and neck pieces. We had to use the trimmings for roast beef. Hash was made from stale bread, trimmings of the ham used for sandwiches, and potatoes, very little meat. A good deal of the food which we served there was not fit to eat. The thing is, while the investigation found that many of the allegations were true, it wasn't bad enough, I guess, to cancel the contract, because it went on for another three years. It wasn't until 1916, when the contract was up, that the new commissioner of the island just decided not to renew. And of course, in the following years, the quality of the food went back up. Everything was good or better than at home. We had white bread to eat here, and meat too. We don't always get white bread and meat at home. You have to realize that many of the people who were coming into Ellis Island at this time had been on the verge of starvation in the weeks, months, or even years before coming. In fact, lack of food was one of the number one reasons that people were leaving their homes in Europe to try to make a better life in America. So having any food at all was, was an incredible win. Though, even when the food was of good quality, sometimes it was different and, and not what the people were used to, and they, they made that known. We got oatmeal for breakfast, and I didn't know what it was, with the brown sugar on it, you know. I couldn't get myself to eat it, so I put it on the windowsill, let the birds eat it. When I ate at Ellis Island, I had soup. After the soup, I had coffee. I never tasted coffee. I was afraid of coffee, so I took a glass of milk and we had a piece of cake. 
Another food that seemed to perplex the people was ice cream. There were times when ice cream was served on special occasions, like in Easter of 1902, but by the 1920s, it seems to have become a staple on the menu. Immigrants landing from Ellis Island now receive one of their first bits of Americanization when they taste ice cream, which is new on the menu. I am told that some of them think it a new brand of butter and spread it on their bread. Of course, they did have ice cream in Europe. It had been there for centuries, long before it was ever in America, but most of the people probably had, had never had the option to try it, I guess. The other foods that were unfamiliar accompanied a holiday, which was unfamiliar. Thanksgiving. Many have their first Thanksgiving dinner on Ellis Island. Many immigrants learned for the first time yesterday the significance of Thanksgiving Day in America. 350 foreigners sat down at Ellis Island to a feast of turkey, vegetables, pies, and puddings. The happy immigrants were ranged along long tables laden with good things. They sat down at two o'clock, and for the next two hours they ate, drank, and were exceedingly merry. The young girls were bedecked with sprigs of celery plucked from the stalks on the table by gallant young men. The foods that seemed to puzzle them most were the turkey, the cranberry sauce, and the mince pie, something that was very common in America at the time. Not so common these days, but it is still common in parts of Europe, especially in England. But for the rest of Europe, mince pie was a novelty as to form, if not to contents, to everyone who sat down to his first Thanksgiving dinner. Half a pie was served to each, but it was some minutes before the diners could make up their minds as to what they were getting and as to whether they would risk it. When once they buried their teeth in the spicy filling, it was easy to see that they would be willing converts to the great American practice of pie eating. Christmas offered similar feasts along with gifts for everyone present, regardless of their religion. So the food quality on Ellis Island over the years really had its ups and downs. But by the 1920s, it seems to have stabilized into something pretty good. Menus from the time show three well-portioned meals every day. Children had snacks of graham crackers and milk throughout the day, and the adults enjoyed everything from corned beef hash with green peppers to ragu of mutton with boiled potatoes, and even desserts like Liberty Pudding. Unfortunately, I couldn't find out what Liberty Pudding was, or else that's what I would have been making today. I found old recipes for Liberty Pie and other Liberty dishes, but they don't seem to have anything in common other than, other than their name, so I don't really know what Liberty Pudding was. So instead, I'll have to be fine with the tapioca pudding that I'm making to go along with my beef soup. So once the soup is ready, you can remove the bones, and you'll notice how all of the flavorful marrow has melted away into the soup. And as for the tapioca pudding, even without any eggs, it has firmed up quite a lot, much more than I'd expected. So scoop a serving onto a plate and top with some brown sugar and cream. And here we are, a dinner from Ellis Island circa 1920. So I'm gonna start with the soup. And I'm actually having to kind of look for the, um, for the beef. There is, there's not that much meat in there. It's more just there for flavor. Um, so it's mostly vegetables. Here we go. Hmm. Hearty. I mean, there's a lot of broth to it. Um, so it, it, it is definitely more like a soup than, than like a stew. But there is a lot of flavor in there. And I, I feel like it's the, the marrow, but it has this unctuous kind of greasy mouthfeel to it. Not unpleasantly so, but it makes it so it feels much more substantial than, than I feel like it actually is. Um, or maybe it is. I mean, there is a lot of nutrients in, in bone marrow. But yeah, I'm like searching for pieces of the meat, but it's been in there so long that it's just kind of disintegrated into tiny little fragments. But the flavor is really good. And now the pudding. It is, it is firm, it's like wobbly. It, it does not have the same consistency as a modern um, tapioca pudding, I feel. But definitely gonna get some of that sugar and the cream. <laughs> so the flavor is really nice now. It's not as sweet as a modern day um, tapioca pudding would be. And it's not as, well, it's just a lot more firm. I'm just so surprised because the eggs are very often there to firm it up, though tapioca is a thickener in and of itself. So maybe it's just the quantity of tapioca 
versus the quantity of milk that was used, but it is very, very firm, which is more like a pudding at that period in time, because they would have been referring to like steamed puddings that hold their shape. And that's really what this feels like, but it's tasty. So again, you have to imagine that you've been eating very, very little for the past few weeks or months or maybe years. So this would have been a really wonderful meal to, to eat, especially because it was free. But even with a good meal, I'm sure everyone was looking forward to getting off of Ellis Island and heading to their new life in America. So try these if you, if you want. You don't have to, they're not, they're not stellar or anything, but it's kind of interesting to see what our ancestors were eating about a hundred years ago. And I will see you next time on Tasting History.